Good morning. Uh, I apologize for lady computer voice here, but she had to have her say. I'm surprised that I thought only Kent and I were the only two people left in Grand Rapids for the holiday, but there are a few. Before the pandemic, we always had tea down in the community room after every service. We are going to start that again. Uh, so all the socializing and visiting that has been going on in the Dharma Hall for the past, since the pandemic, since we reopened, that wouldn't, won't happen anymore. The Dharma Hall is a special place. And now that we're going to have tea again, please take your conversations down there and leave the hall a hall. There are, at this moment, only two ordained teachers associated with this temple, myself and Tong Jin Su. And Tong Jin Su is in New Orleans, but he's here today with us. He will give the Dharma talk. Please rise and we'll do our opening chant. Page seven. So my voice is painful from the ear, so it's going on good. Take care of my. Thank you. 
Prajna Paramita means the perfection of wisdom, and there is a huge literature in Buddhism called the perfection of literature, uh, the perfection of wisdom literature, and the Heart Sutra is a condensation of all that. It reams and reams and reams of, of uh, writings on the perfection of wisdom. All right, now, if uh, Tong Jin Su is prepared, we will listen to his words. Thank you, Hong Su. Uh, am I coming through okay still? I know we did a mic test earlier. Uh, yes, Great. you are. Uh, is he loud enough or too loud? Or... The Sangha loves you. Thank you, Hong Su. Well, good morning to you all. Uh, as Hung Su said before, my name is Tong Jin Su. I think right now my given name, Caleb, is showing up on the screen. I'm comfortable with either. And like Hung Su said, uh, although I uh, lived in Grand Rapids in the past, currently I'm living in New Orleans, Louisiana, alongside my fiance, cat, and daughter. So uh, it's really nice to join you all this morning, albeit virtually, and see some familiar faces on screen like. Ellen and Peter, I see you guys in the back. So uh, it's nice to be with you all because um, several weeks ago, 
Hung Su asked the Sangha to drop suggestions into the Dana box for topics that members of the Sangha would like to learn more about. Uh, like, what are you curious about? What would you like to learn more? You know, what needs clarification? And as a result, Hung Su gave a Dharma talk about how to create and maintain a home altar or shrine for your practice. And for me, his talk reminded me of the value of very concrete and tactile teachings. I feel that in the past, a lot of my Dharma talks have tended toward the theoretical, so I'd like to get a lot more practical today. Um, so uh, as, I, as you may know, uh, the title of today's Dharma talk is Mantras and Malas. So this is a mala. You probably see them all throughout the Buddhist world. I think there are several statues in the room, like the one of Bodhi, either to my left or to my right. I'm not sure from this perspective. It uh, has a big mala tree. What do they mean? How are they used in practice? Um, these are the questions that I'd like to answer. And at the end of our talk today, you'll have everything you need in order to start a mantra meditation practice at home using a mala like this. So what even is a mala, right? So simply stated, a mala like this is a kind of prayer bead or a series of prayer beads. And as a spiritual technology, so to speak, prayer beads are very old. They're an ancient and global phenomenon. We see them in cultures worldwide. So in fact, while researching this, I learned that the word bead in English comes from an older English word, um, beady, that literally means prayer. So there's already an association between beads and prayers, right? And around the world, we see that Catholics have the rosary, Orthodox Christians have a knotted prayer cord, Muslims use a string of 100 beads called the misbaha. And uh, I learned also archaeology has discovered evidence that uh, ancient Greek pagans may have used uh, prayer beads of some kind as well. And then, of course, on the Indian subcontinent, amongst different Dharmic faiths, whether Sikh, Jain, or Hindu, or Buddhist, um, people use this what we call a japa mala or a mala for short. So japa mala, the name has two parts, japa and mala. Japa means to repeat, and it comes from a root word jap, meaning to utter in a low voice or to call upon. And then mala in turn means a wreath or a garland. Uh, if you've ever been in a Hindu temple, a lot of the time, uh, statues of different deities or gurus are decorated with these huge flower garlands uh, and they're draped around their necks. So that is a, that's like a mala of flowers, right? This is a mala of beads, a, a garland of beads that one uses to repeat uh, certain things in a low voice, right? A japa mala. So customarily, this is a string of 108 beads. And then typically there's a 109th bead as well, somewhere uh, in the mix. You can think of it as like the, the middle, I suppose, of the mala. And usually there's something ornamental on the 109th bead. So for instance, this one just has a red tassel. Sometimes the tassels are said to represent the roots and branches of the Bodhi tree or a lotus. And then I have another mala here that was given to me by Hung Su when I received the precepts. And it, instead of uh, a tassel, just has six beads hanging from the center. And the six beads represent the six paramitas, which are six virtues to cultivate on the Buddhist path. Uh, sometimes this middle bead will have different decorations attached to it. I used to have a mala that had a dharma wheel attached to the middle. Um, and the bead uh, in the middle will often have different names. People will call it the guru bead, the bindu bead, the mother bead, a stupa bead, a sumaru bead, or a lot of the time just a buddha bead. So uh, that, that buddha bead 
uh, tells you uh, that you've reached, you've gone around the mala one time. And I'll talk more about that later and how we, how we use a mala, right? So um, I've also seen malas that have three beads in the middle for the three jewels, um, but what, whatever it has, you know, there's something special that marks out that part of the mala, right? And there are also smaller malas. You'll find that sometimes have 18 beads, 27 beads, or 54 beads. Usually it's some kind of subdivision of 108. And a lot of the time, those smaller malas are worn around the wrist instead of the neck. Uh, some very, very large malas will be wrapped up and then attached to a belt on your hip. Or uh, sometimes, literally, if it's a large enough mala, it's wrapped around the waist. So the materials used in the creation of a mala can vary wildly. Uh, for instance, this mala that I mentioned before is made of tiger's eye. And then this other red mala is made of rosewood. Uh, traditionally, Buddhists have favored wood from the Bodhi tree or seeds from the Bodhi tree. Also, seeds from lotus plants have been popular. Uh, but you'll see everything from animal bone to sandalwood to glass, crystal, pearl, coral, precious stones, bronze, gold, silver. Like uh, one of my um, teachers uses uh, steel. Uh, he has like hard steel beads on a steel cord and it weighs like six, seven pounds. And that's what he uses for his uh, mala. And, you know, in various schools, you'll hear that certain materials have special properties like tiger's eye is grounding. And um, you can go as far into that rabbit hole as you want, you know, seeking out certain malas for certain um conditions you want to cultivate or um, traits you want to cultivate in yourself. But I think ultimately it just should be something personal to you. Uh, it's something you connect with, you like the color, you like the way it feels on your hands. I think that's more important than seeking after a really bright, shiny, expensive necklace, right? So where did this mala come from, right? And how did it become a big part of Buddhism? So like I said, every single religion on the Indian subcontinent uses japa malas and honestly historians aren't really sure when they were invented or which religion used it first uh, so uh, looking at the nikayas which are the earliest buddhist scriptures we have they don't have any mention of malas and in terms of what the historical buddha said he doesn't seem to mention malas at all in any of his talks either and moreover uh, malas aren't used much in Theravada Buddhism, which is the branch of Buddhism whose practices cl most closely resemble the earliest schools. However, we're a Mahayana temple and malas are extremely popular in the world of Mahayana. And they're absolutely essential if you're going to practice Vajrayana. Uh, our earliest evidence for the use of malas by Buddhists comes from China during the fourth and sixth centuries. So you know, at some point, about a thousand years after the historical Buddha, Buddhists were using malas, but we don't know when in that thousand year gap that they became a part of the tradition. But I think we can confidently say that at some point, you know, you know, the Indian subcontinent is a very, very diverse place in terms of culture, religion, language, tribes. And in this cultural exchange at some point uh, in the growing Mahayana movement, probably in the second century, there were some practitioners who said, hey, this is a very useful tool and started using them regularly in their practice. So speaking of practice, how, how even is a mala used, right? At this temple, we've customarily given them out to students upon the reception of their precepts. This is very common. Like, a mala gets given to you by your teacher when you either accept the precepts or you take your bodhisattva vows. It's a gift received uh, usually at these big stages along the path where we're committing to something or we're saying, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm all in for the path of the Buddha, for the path of Dharma, right? And although they're given as these, 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 um, at these symbolic ceremonies and uh, they're connected to our practice, 
unlike a cross worn by Christians or the hammer of Thor worn by some heathens, the point of a mala isn't to wear it in order to express your religious identity or display your religious affiliation. Uh, in Mahayana terms, it's a form of upaya. It's a, a, a form of skillful means, a tool, a piece of technology that aids in the development of wisdom and compassion. And if you wear the mala in public, the point of it is to remind you to embody the Buddha's wisdom in daily, daily life rather than display your religiosity, so to speak. So um, before we get in, into practice, I need to answer the question, why 108 beads, right? So 108 is considered an auspicious or special number in many, many traditions. Uh, all across India, as well as in places outside of India too, right? And you can find, if you look on the internet, there are a gazillion reasons for why 108 is auspicious. And searching through the tradition, I can't really find anything definitive. Uh, but for instance, uh, you know, there are 108 beads. And when in some traditions, you're asked to recite a certain amount of mantras. You will use the beads to count each recitation of the mantra. So for instance, starting with one bead, I might say, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, Om Mani Padme Hum, going down the mala one bead at a time, counting them, right? But I don't count one mala as 108. I count it as 100 ma mantra recitations. Those eight extra beads are said to be there to account for mistakes, either mistakes in counting or mistakes in pronunciation, right? So it's like, we, we just added some room for error, so to speak. Uh, I've also heard it said that uh, those eight beads, rather than being said for the sake of your own development, are said for um, the sake of all living beings. Like those mantra recitations are said in the hopes that other sentient living beings experience compassion, experience a better life, and come to the wisdom of the Buddhist teachings, right? Um, but moreover, there's a another, uh, I guess, tradition, so to speak, uh, within Buddhism that holds that there are 108 classes of experience. If you go online to our YouTube channel, one of our teachers, Susan, has a fantastic video that she recorded and released about two years ago, and it's called Why 108? And she does a really good job explaining this. I'll give the uh, short version, but she goes a little bit more in depth in her video. So, like I said, you can think of it like this. There are 108 classes of experiences, and we get to that number 108 by multiplying a couple different factors. First, we begin with the number six. It is held that there are six sense bases. These bases are the points through which we experience sensual reality. So they are the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind, right? We can hear something, we can taste something, smell something, see something, feel something, or think something. These are the six sense Bases, and you already heard them earlier in the Heart Sutra, right? No eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, mind. And so we derive data from our world through these six sense bases. And from these gates or bases come experiences that can be pleasant, they can be unpleasant, or they can be neutral. So for instance, I might see a sunset that is a pleasant experience with my eyes. So we take the number six, multiply it by three, and we get 18. Moreover, there are held to be three different times in Buddhism, past, present, and future. So if we multiply 18 by three again, we get 54. Moreover, experiences can be classed as either worldly or unworldly, or you might think of unworldly as more, more like um, extra worldly. Worldly experiences, uh, I guess you could say, are 
not spiritual experiences, whereas not unworldly or extraworldly experiences are experiences that help you along the path. It might be a profound moment while taking a walk or while in meditation. But let me give an example of how to classify an experience using this system. Yesterday, I went swimming with my daughter. It was something, you know, feeling the water on my skin is something in my body. It happened yesterday, it's in the past. It was a pleasant experience and it was a worldly experience, not a spiritual experience. So different Buddhist um, schools have used this system to classify experience. And that's why sometimes it's held that 108 is an auspicious number. All right, so how do we use a mala? Simply, simply speaking, a mala is used to count. Um, and you can count prostrations. You can count recitations of sutras or Buddhist scriptures, or you can count mantra recitations. And that's how I typically use a mala and one of the most common ways to use a mala. So basically you take uh, the mala in your hand, uh, you drape it over these first four fingers. Some schools will drape it over the three and then use the index finger to move the beads. But what is most common is to drape the mala over four and then move using the thumb like that. Using a pinching motion, you will pass the beads along your fingers and along your thumb. And then each time you pass the bead with a thumb, you have recited one sutra or recited one mantra or done one prostration. Does that make sense? OK. And so along those lines, I guess that begs the question, what is a mantra? So for those unaware, a mantra is a special sound a special word or a special series of sounds. The word mantra comes from the root man, which means to think, to consider, or to set the heart upon. Most mantras in the tradition appear in Pali or Sanskrit, but they also will appear sometimes in the native languages of East Asian countries too. So like Japanese, Vietnamese, Korean, Tibetan mantras can, th there is no, um, sacred language, so to speak, in Buddhism. All languages can be used by the Buddha or uh, bodhisattvas to convey wisdom, right? So translating mantras sometimes to English can be hard because they don't make literal sentences. And sometimes they're literally just onomatopoeia, right? Like the sound itself sounds like what it means. Um, but and anyway, the mantra is used during meditation, much like the breath is used in meditation. Ultimately, in a session of meditation, we're attempting to develop single-mindedness or shamatha, the um, unification of the mind and devoting it to focus on one thing, whether that is the sensation of the breath coming in and out of the body, or that object of concentration is a mantra, right? And just like the breath, we can use the mantra as an object or anchor for our awareness on the cushion or off the cushion. So while driving, while working, while um, doing the dishes, we can take a deep breath and come back to a state of calm and um, a sense of awareness, uh, a sense of compassion, maybe for ourselves in that moment or somebody else. Uh, or uh, you can use the mantra in that moment as well to come back to focus or come back to co a concentrated state of mind. So oftentimes mantras uh, that are said usually are the names of Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, special figures within Buddhist mythology. And a lot of the time people will recite these names with the intention of becoming more like that Buddha, or more like that Bodhisattva. For instance, you might recite the mantra of Avalokiteshvara to develop more compassion. And in Pure Land Buddhist schools, Hung Su recently gave a fantastic talk about this if you want to learn more. I believe it was called just Pure Land Buddhism. In those schools, Buddhist practitioners will just recite the mantra 
of or the name of the Buddha Amitabha in order to gain rebirth in his pure land. So <clears throat> one thing that's really neat about Amala is that it acts as a counter for your meditation session. I can sit down on the cushion and say, I want to recite one mala of mantras. So a hundred, a hundred mantras, right? Or I want to do five malas, 500 mantras. And then after, you know, reciting them one time, five times, 10 times, I know my meditation session is up. <clears throat> so if you look in front of you, um, by the way, Ken, at this time, would you mind sharing the list of mantras with our um, participants who are in the Zoom room? Thank you, Ken. So if you look in front of you, there's a handout. I believe I slipped into your booklet. This is a list of different mantras that have been shared at the Grand Rapids Buddhist Temple throughout its history. Uh, I wanted to give a couple different options depending on your preferences and proclivities. Whatever uh, I think appeals to you is probably the best to start with. And mantra recitation, I, I find useful. And the reason I wanted to talk, to talk about it today is, you know, I don't always want to simply focus on my breath. I'm a musician and I find that rhythm really works well for me. So mantra recitation is an effective form of meditation for me. It might not be effective for you, but I wanted to give some options and give you something to try uh, along the path that might help you, uh, you know, develop greater single-minded awareness. So uh, on the handout in front of you, uh, you you'll see a um, couple of common mantras and you already recited one today during the Heart Sutra. So the you'll see the second one, mantra of the Heart Sutra, Gate, Gate, Para Gate, Para Samgate, Bodhi Svaha. This is a very common mantra and can be easily recited. Um, but the first mantra on the list, Om Mani Padme Hum, is probably one of the most common in the Buddhist world. It's devoted to the Bodhisattva of Great Compassion, Avalokiteshvara. And you'll hear a lot of different things about what the mantra means, but simply stated, it means something along the lines of, oh, the jewel is in the lotus. And I'm going to use that mantra to, to demonstrate how to, I guess, start a mantra practice. As I said before, Put the mala, drape the mala over the first four fingers of your right hand and try to not let the mala touch the floor in front of you. Place your thumb on the bead that is right next to the uh, guru bead or Buddha bead, so to speak, and recite one mantra. It's best to start slow, to really feel out the sound of the mantra. Om Mani Padme Hum. You can go on YouTube or even look on Spotify. There are a lot of different recordings of people reciting mantras. And um, I think there, like, there is no definitive rhythm that a mantra has to be recited with, but sometimes it's instructive or useful to hear how other people say it, so then you can feel into it yourself. So, um, Starting out slow is the best way to go. Om Mani Padme Om. Om Mani Padme Om. Om Mani Padme Om. And as you go along the mala, just continue to um, proceed the beads along your fingers. Once you have gone all along the mala and the Buddha bead comes back again, once you reach the bead immediately before it, rather than uh, going past the bead, turn it in your hand like this, and then go back the other way. In most traditions, people do not go past the Buddha bead. In fact, when you reach that tassel or that special religious symbol or whatever you find at that part of the necklace, it's a moment to, um, to center, to 
slow down to come to a state of awareness and be like, oh, I did one full mala and then begin again, right? You'll also see there's a mantra on there of Shakyamuni Buddha, who's the historical Buddha. It's Om Muni Muni Mahamuni Shakyamuni Svaha, which means, um, oh, sage, sage, great sage of the Shakya clan. Um, Woohoo! Svaha is the end of a lot of mantras. And our former teacher, Susan, would say it really just translates to like, yippee or woohoo! Hooray! Like, uh, like I said earlier, some of them are hard to uh, translate because they're 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 just like um, onomatopoeia, right? Like, yay! Uh, and Om, the beginning of a lot of mantras, is uh, said to be a sound through which all like all sounds start. You'll also see on there at the end the mantra of the original mind of Amitabha Buddha the names, different ways of chanting Amitabha's names, and then also the mantra of shattering hell. Those last two come from the morning bell chant, which I believe you can find in your uh, practice booklet. We typically recite those, uh, re or recite the morning bell chant on Sunday mornings at 9.30. I don't believe we recited it this morning, but it is something that Gajisu is often doing on Sundays. Um, so I'll just, show how some of these are pronounced. I gave the Sanskrit, Korean, and Japanese form of Amitabha's name. So in Sanskrit, you'd say Namo Amitabha. In Korean, you'd say Namu Amitabul. And in Japanese, it's Namu Amitabutsu. Um, the Korean version is the one I learned from Ansu and Susan, who taught here at the temple. And they'd say it in a rhythm like this. Namu Amitabul, Namu Amitabul. You can take that rhythm and just keep it at that pace, or you can accelerate it as you practice. One thing I find with reciting mantras is it feels like building pressure uh, going along the, the mala. As I recite the mantras, I usually build in volume and speed as I go. And at a certain point, it feels like a bubble pops. And at that moment, I stop reciting and I just sit back and relax into the expansive state of our natural mind. I think this is one of the best ways to use uh, mantras and malas in our practice is that it helps to develop that single pointed awareness, a clear mind, and then we can sit back, relax, and focus on the breath. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'd like to open up, up to the floor at this time. I know um, this is kind of a strange and oftentimes esoteric subject. So if anyone has any questions at this time, I'm open to answering them. Anybody? It's not, is it on? It's not really a question. I was looking this morning online on how the proper way to hold the, the mala. So I appreciate you doing this subject today. It really helped me, so thank you. No problem. Within different uh, schools too, you'll find some things that say, oh, if you do it on this finger, it does something different than doing it on this finger or this finger, but all you need to do is just hold it like this, really. So you're welcome. I saw a question in the Zoom chat come up. Somebody asked, is there a symbolic reason why we should obtain a mala from someone else? Not really. I think you can obtain a mala on your own. Um, we, I believe, sell them in the Buddha boutique downstairs. So if you see one that appeals to you, by all means, uh, buy it. I think sometimes if you receive a mala from a teacher, though, that can be a, there's like a nice personal connection there. And we will have a preceptor class this fall uh, taught by um, Ryan. I'm trying to think of his Dharma name. I forgive Jingsu. Um, and at the end, he will give malas to the preceptors.
Tong Jin Su. Yes, Hong Su. Uh, we are going to have a uh, precept ceremony in June for oh. two people, one here, uh, she's sitting here, and uh, Jing Su's wife is taking the precepts because she doesn't want her husband to be her teacher and he doesn't want his wife to be his student, so <laughs> that, there will be one sooner. Fantastic. Great. So one thing I wanted to offer up is if I were if I were there in person with you all, I'd suggest we do like a mantra meditation session, but I don't I, I don't know how I feel about like the feedback for, from zoom or how that would work out. So I think during meditation today we'll just do a silent meditation upon the breath, but I highly encourage you to you know get yourself a mala take home the handout and try out a couple of these um, mantras on your cushion and if you have further questions about using this during practice, by all means, you can reach out to me uh, via email. I believe I'm cmccoy at zengr.org. Any other questions? I believe the, there's a lucky There is a question. Um, I was wondering, um, could you also use it like for like for affirmations also? You know what I mean, like that. You know. Yeah, I mean, uh, like uh, something along the lines of like, like if somebody wants to build up their self esteem and stuff like sure. that. Also, in your meditation, like I am healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm healthy, wealthy, and wise. That is a way that. Um, Mantra recitation, I think, has has um, bled over into the English speaking world. I have heard of people doing that. How much can you see of us? How much can you see of us? I can see. I can't see anybody beyond Ellen, and I can't really see any further than I don't know. Five six feet to your left, Hong Su. It's a pretty limited limited view. You know, I uh, we've been here. I think we're going into our fifth year at the temple, and I never felt like um, it was ever time for me to acquire a mala because I didn't want I didn't want it to look like. I had this thing draped around my neck and I didn't even know what it was about, so I wasn't going to buy it. But I think I'm ready now. Thank you. You're welcome, Ellen. Thank you for sharing that. I believe we're ready for meditation. Am I leading or are you? Would you lead it, please, Sung Su? I will. One, one final note I want to add is that you can also recite mantras internally. It needn't be say, said out loud. So if during silent med meditation, you want to turn a mantra over and over in your mind, by all means, go ahead. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Thank you, Tong Jin Su. Before we start, we start our meditation, I'd like to I should have said this earlier, but I forgot. Um, there's a little candle on a table here. Friday, we had a, a service for the children who had been killed in Texas. And that grew into a service for the many, many, many 214, I believe, mass shootings since January 1st. So we meditated, we lit a candle, we spoke about it, and it was a very, very warm and healing. Uh, the uh, uh, mantra sheets that are in your booklet, if you want to take those home, you may. And there's some extra, aren't there some extra there, William? Yes. Okay, if you want to take a few extra, help yourself. Please prepare yourself for meditation. This will be a short one today.
We bow. We had a short meditation because we had a very informative uh, Dharma talk, but that's fine. And uh, this is the time when I would tell you all the announcements. The cheat sheet that I use is in the drawer. I forgot to pull it up before we put the TV up, but if you want to know what's happening, look on our website. There is a There are recovery meetings. There is a uh, discussion group Thursday mornings. Are one of you speaking? Kate or Gail? No, I'm not, uh, I think that's it. Uh, Thank you. My name is Gail. Given name is Gail. My Dharma name is Katya Sue. I'm on the fundraising committee and I'm also on the board. I was thinking today what I wanted to say. It looks like some of you are new, so welcome. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask Hung Su, myself. I mean, ask, just ask. Sometimes we don't approach you because, well, I'll say this for me. We don't approach you because we want to respect your privacy, but we also want you to know that you're very welcome and, and we're open to any questions or inquiry that you have. The temple here is entirely on donations, and by that I mean people volunteer their time to clean outside the temple, to clean inside the temple, to buy supplies, to have the tea in the teapots, to buy the cushions, to buy the incense. And we also volunteer a great deal of our time. Um, we maintain a small little garden out by the fence. And if I can just say, can I tell a kind of an interesting story? Um, a couple of folks, we maintain this garden and I happened to be there last week. And I've met some of the neatest people, um, socioeconomically challenged folks that walk up and down. And the, a lady last week told me that this building used to be a, a porn shop. Yeah. <laughs> And so I think it's only fitting that we're here now. <laughs> um, we'll have the Buddha boutique open downstairs. We do have malas. We don't have a lot in there because at this moment in time, we're reevaluating really what we are traditionally as a temple. Did I say that correctly? Okay. Um, anything else, Kate? Kate, Kate, where are you? Oh, yes, thank you. Donations, there are Donna boxes at either end, and should you forget, there's one downstairs. Sign up for our newsletter because all the announcements and um, really important information are on the newsletter and you can just sign up on the website. Uh, you can also, which is really, we get a small amount if you do Amazon Smile, you designate the temple and it's a nominal amount, but it is something that's helpful and given the fact most people shop online. Uh, below YouTube, there's a link. Um, what else, Kate? Okay. Okay, drop down arrow. Okay, perfect. And there's also, um, connections in the newsletter. So thank you very much. Please remember that we are now returning to the uh, silence in the Dharma Hall. So when the service is over, if you want to visit, which I hope you do, just go downstairs. And people who know where the tea kettle is, the silver one's got tea in it. Show anyone who doesn't. Uh, go down the stairs and the kitchen's right there so underneath you. So there's where the tea is. Uh, if you want to, yeah, take the paper if you want. I believe that's it, except for our closing gatas. Please stand. And they are on page nine. Thank you. And together we say, for all unskillful actions ever committed by me, sensible. On account of my beginning of greed, anger, and ignorance, born of my body, mouth, and thoughts, now I atone for them all. Fast is the robe of compassion, a form 
longer steal the friend faction. I wear the Buddhist teachings to the benefit of all sentient beings. All beings, one body, I vow to liberate. In this blind fashion, I vow to uproot. Dharma gates without number, I vow to penetrate. The great way of Buddha, I vow to attain. Let's turn and face each other and talk to one another. Please just read your booklet on your cushion and leave your cushion plain. Go down and have some tea and give a hug to one another. What's your